Well, exciting times. And you know, last week we kind of talked about, we dived into a series that I've called DNA. And today as we dive into part two of this series, I'm going to uh, name some slogans. You may, you may see up here a, a slogan that we're going to talk about today. We may, I call it a mantra. Loving God, loving people, making Jesus known. But there are some famous ones that you may be aware of. So I'm going to show it. And if you know it, just go ahead and shout it out. If you're at home, you're going to have to shout pretty loud because it's a long way from this house to your house today. So if I said this, America runs on Duncan, exactly right. Or what do you, when you hear these words, go ahead that next slide, please. There. Yeah, what, what do you think of? Subway, you got it going on. What if I said the quicker picker upper? Bounty, that's right. Or what if, buddies, not to shine. What if I said, just do it, just do it. Nike, that's right there. And then you may show your age with this one, but what if I said this? Where's the beef? <laughs> Wendy's, hey, perhaps the greatest one out there. And then what? This last one, happiest place on earth. No. Oh, Walmart, I heard that. <laughs> Hey, 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 I am with you. I am with you because look what I put. <laughs> you may have been thinking this guy, but hey, it could be Walmart, Norfolk Church. You know, it may not be the other ones. Oh, so many things. Well, we have a slogan as well that you saw. Again, I, I often call it our mantra. And as we dive back into the DNA of this church family, uh, I want this to be what people think of when they think of the name of Northville Church. I want it to be uh, in our community. They are people who love God. They are a people who love people, and they are a people who live to make the story of Jesus known. But how did we get there? How did it start? Well, last week, we kind of dived back in, back before the date we moved in this building, back before the date of the school, back to a time when Northfield was just a seed and a, 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 you know, a plan, a dream, and a, an invitation on the part of some of you to be a part of it. We talked about my journey from the world of explosives and finance to, the, to this world. And then we talked about the name where Northfield came from. We're going to go back and talk about that just a little bit more today because it plays into our vision going forward. We got the name North, if you remember from last week, from the church that planted us, which was in Madison. We were just north of them, so that's how the word North came along. And then that word Field is the one we're going to land on for just a few moments. And I want to expand on it more than we did last week because it really set the stage for the type of church that we wanted to be. The story is found in John chapter 4 where that word Field comes into uh, play. And in this story, if you remember from last week, Jesus goes against all protocol. He goes against all customs. He goes against all the traditional mores of, of his people when he stops at a well. In fact, he told his disciples, we have to go to Samaria. Well, they really didn't have to. They could have gone around Samaria like every other Jewish person would have done. But Jesus looks through his guys and says, no, we have to go through Samaria. And so he gets there. The disciples, they leave. They're going off on a lunch run. He's there at a well alone when all of a sudden a Samaria. Samaritan woman shows up. Number one, she's a woman. Number two, Samaritan just no-nos in the Jewish culture. And this wasn't just any woman. She was a woman who had had five husbands. And at the current time, she was, how shall I put it, shacking up with some guy. And Jesus knew about that. Well, if you follow the story in John chapter 4, she's astounded that he knows so much about her. And he looks and he, she says to uh, Jesus, well, you must be a prophet. And then she asked Jesus, I think it's kind of an attempt to change the dialogue or the conversation from these five husbands and who she's living with now to something else. And she says, she, she asked him about worship and, and where is it? Well, the Jews say here, the Samaritans say here, you know, is it this mountain? Is it that mountain? And Jesus looks to her and he tells her a little bit about worship. And he says, well, really, you know, it, it's not really there. It's not really over there. There's a time coming when, when worship is, is within you. It's in here. And she's like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, I know. That, that's complicated. But one day, one day when Messiah comes, one day, one day when the, the Messiah that we've been waiting on and longing for, one day when he gets here, when he arrives, well, he's going to explain all of that to us. And can you imagine in the moment, in a dusty road on the outskirts of Samaria, here's this lady talking about when Messiah comes to Messiah. And Jesus looks to her and he says, this Messiah that you've been waiting on, this Messiah that, that you've been telling me that when he comes, he's going to explain all of this to you. When he arrives, well, guess what? This Messiah is me. 
And he tells her all about her life. A lot of things that she would have probably longed to have forgotten and put in the past. And well, after all this, she runs into the city. She tells everyone to come out and meet him, which is kind of astounding to somebody who's just told you all the stuff that you've ever done. Well, the whole town comes out to see Jesus. The disciples get back from their lunch run. And when they look and, and they're like, uh, uh, they're like, Jesus, you need to eat. And where did all these people come from? And Jesus looks at them and says, well, I got food that you don't even know about. And they're like, you got food? Where'd you get it? And then he says to his disciples in verse 35, these words. Don't you have a saying? It was still four months and then the harvest. And in a sentence, Jesus changes the whole dialogue. The whole conversation turns from a dialogue about water and you're Samaritan and I'm Jewish to a dialogue about purpose and a dialogue about mission. And Jesus looks to the guys who were following him and he says these words. He says, you have a saying, don't you? Well, it's it's four months out there in the future somewhere. The harvest is somewhere up there. Four months of waiting, four months of watering, four months of tilling the soil. Which is all good if you're talking about grain and wheat. Then maybe so, it's four months away. But if you understood that the harvest I'm looking for, Jesus would say, is people who were looking for me. Well, you would understand why I said we have to go through Samaria. If you understood that the mission of God on this earth was about people, then you would understand why I go to the places no one else is going. And if you understood that the mission was about people, then you would understand why I'm sitting here talking with someone that you have been taught to avoid. And then Jesus completes this this, this statement in verse 35 by saying this, I tell you, not four months to the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look out at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. And as we told you last week, that's where the word field came from. And with it, uh, Northfield came this idea, this DNA that Jesus was teaching. That it's not four, six, or eight, or even a year out in the future that you can find a harvest of people who are wanting to hear and know about God. But as you go about your cities and your communities and your towns, the places where we live and eat and shop and play, they all have people who, like this lady, are looking for Messiah, looking for something better, looking for something to hold on to. And they are looking today, he says, which begs the question, are we looking? Are we looking? Is it in our DNA to look out and to notice those people that no one else is noticing? And I think Jesus to them says, you know, while you ponder and while you wonder what would Messiah do and how he would act, he says, I'm showing you what he would do. He'd go to the places no one else is going to. So you're saying four months and then we find? I say, no, no, look today, the fields are right. But it's even more than that when I think about the mission of this church. Last week I told you early on that there were things that I wrote down and uh, ideas that I had that if I wanted to leave that world and come into uh, to this one uh, in, a, in, a, in a full-time capacity that, that was paid. I think my wife and I have always kind of been full-time, uh, uh, which, we, which we all are. If, if you're a member of God's church, you're, you're a full-time member. There ain't no part-time in and out, but you know in the role that I'm in now. Uh, one of the things I wrote down that I told you last week is I wanted this to be a place where people felt welcome regardless of whether their family had it all together or whether their family was falling apart. And that goal came from this story. That goal came from looking at a Messiah who would tell a five-time divorcee on the outskirts of this town, Hey, hey, I got something for you. So much so that she goes back and she runs into the city. But, you know, it was really more than just that one subject. When I look back on my past and, and sometimes how I was, uh, you know, brought up at times, uh, it's kind of easy to ignore people on the fringes, isn't it? It became uh, easy early on to, uh, to, to just kind of put them to the side. And what if you look like us and you act like us and you behave like us? Then, hey, you can be one of us. But all of a sudden, I saw Jesus welcoming and looking in and accepting people whose behavior had not yet even changed to what he wanted it to be. And I looked and I found that he was kind to them. He didn't shy away from speaking truth over their lives and neither should we. But neither did he avoid them or turn them away. It was so much a part of who Jesus was that the religious people actually turned it against him. And they said these words in Luke 
He said, 15.2, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. Anybody have anybody that mutters in your house? If you've got young children, you might know what muttering is. If you've got a husband or wife, there may be times when you've muttered. If you look at some of the, the other translations, they'll say grumbled or complained and all of those. So, so what is it that they're grumbling and they're complaining about Jesus? Well, they're grumbling and complaining about what we might hear grumbling and complaining about if we live in the tension of between where people are and where we would like them to be. What they muttered and complained about was this, that this man welcomes. It's not that he tolerates it's not that he puts up with for the moment. He welcomes sinners and he eats with them. I once heard Andy Stanley say, I don't know if it originated with him or not, but he said, people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And that resonated with me. And I thought there must have been something pretty special about Jesus. That he can come up to this lady and, and he can tell her all about her life, the good stuff, the bad stuff, and she's not turned away. He says it in such a way that she runs to the city and she grabs the entire town. And she says, you got to meet this guy out there. And to me, the story was just a picture of the DNA of this new church that we were asked to be a part of. So from the very beginning, this story is one that's meant a lot to me. Because it wasn't just a story that gave us part of our name. It was a story that helped define our purpose and we defined the people that we wanted to be. And so with a name and a purpose, we started meeting. Uh, we had about six months of meeting at my home on Sunday nights. There were about 20 of us there. Then on October 4th, 2009, we launched Northfield Church in the cafeteria of Knox Dallas Middle School. We had four setup teams that rotated and we did everything. We touched chairs, moved chairs. If there was something to do with the chair, we did it. Uh, we all wore name tags so we could remember who each other were. We, we prayed over lockers. We gave out school supplies and so many other things. And the name tags, what I liked most about them is that not only when, uh, when new people come in that we would know who they were but they you know they, we could go back and forth and we could look at somebody and call them by name it was it was incredible we moved from the cafeteria to the gym about two years maybe a little bit more in and from that initial 20 that had grown to 70 by launch time uh, when we launched uh, uh, and, and ended our time after six years in the cafeteria we were up to about 250 people but during those three years there came another pivotal moment that I think would help define the DNA of who we were and because of that uh, uh, Seminar that I told you last week where Rick Warren looked and, he's, and, and he just says, somebody's out there thinking about changing. Somebody's thinking about doing something and the fields are ripe. Well, from that very same seminar, a different speaker that I had gone to, he began to ask some questions. And uh, the questions can be uncomfortable at first, but I'm going to live in the uncomfortableness for just a minute. The question that came from that seminar with me was, what if we were just a church? What if we were not this brand of church or this brand of church? What if we were just a church? And then he asked a question, and I'll use, and I don't know if these are the exact names he used, but I'll use ones that apply to me. We came from the churches of Christ. So his question would have been, uh, you know, who goes to churches of Christ? Well, his answer was church of Christ people. Well, you know, in general, that's true. Who goes to Baptist churches, he would say? Well, in general, Baptist people. Who goes to Methodist churches? Well, generally people that are Methodists. And his question became one, the question that came next would become, become one that would shape how I thought. He said, where do the people go that don't identify with any of those? What do the people go that if they're looking and, and they think, well, I'm not that or I'm not that, and they don't really know what they are yet, where do they go? And I started asking the question, could we just be a church? What would that look like? And so, do we have to be this one, that one? And that led to more questions. You know, what would it look like? And I knew when you first say the word church, what do most people think of? A building, don't they? They think of a building. And we didn't have a building. I mean, we were in like a rented space. And the, the government owned our building. Or Sumner County owned our, our, you know, the building that we were in over there. So we knew that our defini def definition of church couldn't be a building because we didn't have one. And we ended up through a study defining church like this. If that's what we want to be, just a church. Well, what is that? A church. Well, we are the called out group of people empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue the work of Jesus on this earth. Who are we? We are the called out group of people empowered by the Holy Spirit 
to continue the work of Jesus on this earth. So what would that look like? Well, that question ultimately led to us just becoming known as Northfield Church. We started saving funds to, you know, to, to buy a building. And we looked so many places. One of the, one of the places that came open was a, uh, was a garage that had oil stains all over it. And they were moving out. And I remember going in there. And, and like there was a little bit of excitement because maybe we could buy this garage. But I remember my wife saying, it smells like oil in here. It smells like somebody just changed their oil. And she goes, we're going to have to buy a lot of Lysol if we move this place. And uh, anyway, uh, for... Uh, you know, by the grace of God, we did, not, we did not get that place. And it wasn't the place for us. But we looked at storage units. I can't think of how many places that we looked. And one day we were meeting at my house. There were a group of 20 of us who were uh, trying to think, you know, what is next and where do we need to go? When David Gregory spoke up and said, you know what? I think that this building is for sale. And we were like, really? There's no for sale sign of the yard. And I guess churches don't do that when they're ready to move. They don't put for sale, you know, anyway. But we came up here. It was getting close to 10 o'clock at night. There were about 20 of us. Well, and we were peering in the windows and you couldn't see anything in the windows because it was dark in here. Well, we got our cars and we made a semicircle in the parking lot right out there in front. And we all shined our lights in the building. And we were like this. It was our own E.T. moment uh, going on. And then the police showed up with their lights on like, what are you people doing and looking in the windows? And we're like, we, don't, we, we heard this building was for sale. But uh, all that stuff going on. And it was just over a year later on December the Uh, December 2015 that God enabled us through a company called the Solomon Foundation to actually purchase this building. The Sunday before uh, uh, that we announced that that we had found it and everybody knew that we were looking so that wasn't a surprise but Melissa Lancaster made a video. She walked through this building. Keith Hall provided the the voice on the video. He was like the voice of God. He has this deep booming voice that I pray in heaven that's what I'm going to have. But anyway we needed 250,000 to make it happen and uh, I thought, where are we going to get $250,000? That's a lot from just us in here. So, we, you know, we made the announcement. We said, hey, this is what we want to do. And uh, that was our fleece. We, we needed it in two weeks. If we can get $250,000, that would be our sign to go ahead. And two weeks later, we took up a regular contribution. And then we took up uh, this contribution for this building. And there were $255,000 in the offering plate. And we thought, wow, we're supposed, we're supposed to do this. And uh, uh, so on December 15th, Keith Dyer and I met with the bank and we bought a building. We didn't buy a church because the church is the people. We just bought a tool that hopefully that we as a church would use for, for the glory of God and for this community. And some of you know that this building needed a lot of work. Uh, uh, that very day in the, that final walkthrough, we walked through what now the steps that lead down to the Sumner Center and water was protruding into the walls. The ceiling was dropping down. If you were in here, this room alone had uh, the... Uh, a company that fixed the roof told us 70 active leaks in different parts of the roofing system that was up here. There were pews over here that you could not even sit in because they had begun to deteriorate. And uh, out in the lobby, there was a steeple. The steeple had broken through the top of the lobby out there and water was dripping. And they were having church in here. And I have to tell you, it looked good in the dark. Uh, you know, if you turn... <laughs> If you just had a little bit of shadow light, you know how your Christmas tree, it looks a lot better when it's dark? You know, this is kind of like the building that we were in. We did a Christmas Eve service that year, and then that's the only service we did for nine months. We, we closed back down to kind of renovate, but I thought, you know, this, 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 you know, it's like ugly people. Everybody looks good in the dark, and that's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of like we thought, thought about here. And I remember us looking and thinking at each other and thinking, what in the world have we done? And And by that, I didn't mean uh, Keith and I. What I meant by that is, what have we done? Well, that became really a defining moment for what we wanted to to be a value that we represented. And what we did was this. We said, we want to be a people who pray big prayers. And we want to be a people who act in big faith. If the goal we have is so small, we don't need God to accomplish it, then it's, it's not a God goal. It may be a Tom goal, but it's not a God goal. And so we said, wherever we go, whatever, whatever we do. And you take not to shine, for example. It would be comfortable to stay with 125 people. We know that. But hey, let's, let's you know. And, and there were t- sometimes we look, should we go up 5? Should we go up 10? Should we go up 15? We look and we say, no, let's, let's jump to 50. Let, let's, let's, let's do something else. And I don't know how that will turn out. We're going to make the most of it. We're going to have fun that night. But we're going to learn from it. But we're not going to stop dreaming big. And we're not going to stop praying big prayers Because we said we want God to have to be in the mix. Well, 
All of that going on. The day before we opened, I think all 200 people who were a part of Northfield were up here cleaning, wiping, dusting, and doing all the things that it took uh, to uh, really go for that opening day. And, you know, back then, we had no maintenance staff. We had no buildings guy. We had, really, we all were our own repair people. There were three people on staff, Trent, Haley, myself, and an army of servant volunteer leaders. And, and this church really works the same way today. We have more people on staff. But there is an army of you guys that come along. And you make what we do happen. It wouldn't happen without you. We opened on September the 18th of 2016, and we had bought as our mission statement. Our slogan was this, the Northfield Church exists to love God, love people, and make Jesus known. And what I wanted to do, just as we close today, tell you where that came from. Like all the other slogans that I showed you at the very beginning, as we sat around a table, we thought, well, we got to have a catchy phrase. You know, we got to have something. You know, we're a church, but, you know, what's a phrase that would define who we were? So we were looking through books, and we were Googling, and all that, you know, all that stuff. When finally it hit us, we thought, we don't need to come up with a slogan. We don't need to come up with a mantra. Jesus gave us our mission. So if we wanted a mission statement, why won't we just pull from the words of Jesus? So uh, as, we, as we begin to think about that, we thought the thing that we wanted the most. Jesus called them the two greats in Scripture. And if Jesus called them great, we thought it must be great and we just need to use it. First great in Scripture, anybody know the great commandment? I hear that out there and I heard the other one a few times. Matthew 22 is it's one of those chapters where... The religious people is near the end of Jesus' life, and the religious people are trying to get, uh, you know, the crowds to turn away from Jesus, so they try to trap him. The Pharisees, they make their first, you know, they're experts in the law, they make their first go at it, so when they ask him a question about taxes and Caesar, and that's always a good icebreaker, isn't it, at any occasion? I mean, let's talk about taxes, and, uh, uh, and they think they've got Jesus anyway. If he says, yeah, you need to pay more taxes to Rome, well, the, the, you know, the Jewish people who are following him, they'll turn against you because they are taxed to death already. And if he says, no, you don't need to pay taxes to Rome, then we've still got him as well because we don't even have to worry about him at that point. The Roman people will come in. They'll charge him with insurrection. Either way, we'll get rid of him. Anyway, doesn't work out. Jesus kind of turns that whole thing on a dime. I'll let you read later on about what he says. But then the Sadducees, they step up to the plate. And they decide, well, since the Pharisees couldn't do it, Sadducees, the other ruling kind of religious body of their day, and they decide that they are going to ask him a question about the resurrection, which is ironic because the Sadducees didn't even believe in the resurrection. Well, they they, they find this little law in the book of, in, in the book of Moses. It really, it was in the law of Moses. And it was really meant to protect people. It may sound a little bit strange to us. But here it is. I'll throw it out there. It was if you got a guy and he's married to a lady. And he dies. And there are no children. Well, then if he has a brother, this brother comes in and kind of steps in his place. And, and has, you know, helps this lady have children to protect her and take care of her. It was really a protecting thing in their society. But Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection are going to try to trick him in a question about the resurrection because they know Jesus believes in it. They know that Jesus believes and talks about a life after this life. So they say, hey, Jesus, we got this issue we want, we want to tell you about. This guy marries this girl, but he dies. And so his brother, brother number two, comes in here and marries her. But as fate would have it, he also dies. She still has no children. But as luck would have it, he has a third brother. So third brother steps in here and he they had no children either. As fate would have it, brother number three dies. But as luck would have it, she has a fourth brother. Can you begin to like, I'm wondering if the people in the audience are like, where are they going with this? Because I'm thinking, if I'm that fourth brother, I'm saying, oh, I know why. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I like Moses, but I like me too. I'm, you know... But anyway, they go through this whole scenario. Brother number four, brother number five, brother number six, brother number seven. They all die. Well, then she has to be old by now because they say, well, then she dies. And then they ask a question, whose wife will she be in the resurrection? If you really believe in the resurrection. And they think they have him. Again, I'll let you go home and read how Jesus answers them. But he really says, you don't even know really what you're talking about. You don't understand forever. And you don't understand hereafter. But anyway, uh, when Matthew says that the Pharisees took their stab. And then the Sadducees took their stab. One of the Pharisees kind of steps out. And Matthew says, upon hearing that Jesus had silenced the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He steps up to the plate with a question. His question is this. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? 
Of these 300 laws that Moses gave us. Of these 300 laws that we have added to help us keep the 300 laws that Moses gave. Which is the greatest? Which one is the one that we need to be thinking about? And Jesus says, well, if you want to know what the greatest is, here it is. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. To which I think this young lawyer would have felt pretty good about himself. Because that is a direct quote from the book of Deuteronomy. The Shema, you may have heard, where they're about to go in and possess the land that God has promised them. And he says, if you want to live long, if you want to prosper in the land, then here's what you need to do. You need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I think that this young lawyer, while maybe not achieving his purpose, he felt pretty good because, because he valued. He was a Pharisee. They were experts in keeping the law. And they equated love. God to their ability to keep all of these laws. So I'm thinking, he's thinking, well, I turned out pretty good this equation. I'm not going to risk it. And in my mind, he starts walking away. Now, I don't know if it happened that way, but as he's walking away, in my mind, Jesus says, hey, 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 Mr. Lawyer Man, not so fast. Come back here. And then Jesus looks and, well, 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 from that, loving, loving God with all you have, that's where we got the first part of our mission statement, the Northville Church exists to love God. That's where that came from. First and greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We don't, we don't have to find it. We don't have to discover it. We just got to do it. That's what he said. Anyway, anyway, so the lawyer starts to walk away. Jesus says, hey, hey, hey. There's a part two to this thing. There's, a, there's something that you're not playing on. The lawyer turns around and Jesus says these words. And a second is like it. To which would, which would have shaken that lawyer to its core. Because when we think of second, we think of second place, don't we? As in there is a first place and there is a second place. But that's not what Jesus said to this guy. He didn't say loving God was number one and loving what he's about to say is number two. What he was saying is this, there is a second, first, and greatest commandment. And I think the lawyer would have been a second, first. How, how I, I don't even understand. And Jesus says, if you want to know the second, first, and greatest commandment, here it is. Love your neighbor like you love yourself. Not second as in second place, but second as in a second, first. And all of a sudden, Jesus connects loving God, not with keeping law, but loving God with the way we love each other. Like he had done with that woman by the well. Well, all of those things going on, the Jewish leaders had spent generations making more and more complicated laws to follow. And all of a sudden, Jesus sums it up in two commands, which he says are really one. And we got the second part of that mission statement. The Northfield Church exists to love God and to love people. And I've got minus T minus 30 seconds and counting. So here we go with the last part. The last part of that came from the Great Commission. Let's just read through it and you guys will, will get it on your own. It's Matthew chapter 28. It's uh, Jesus at the end, you know, at the end, death, burial, resurrection. Well, not resurrection. Yeah, resurrection. Death, burial, resurrection, just not ascension. It's happened yet. He's about to go up into heaven. He looks and he says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority. Wouldn't you like to know somebody's got all authority? Like there is not a thing in this universe that I don't have authority over. Having all of that authority, let me tell you, in heaven and on earth, this is what I want you to do. Go and make disciples of all nations, not just the Jewish nation, of all nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I want you to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I will be with you to the very ends of the earth it's been a little over 2,000 years since Jesus looked at those first followers and said, go tell the story. And here we are, 2,000 some years removed and a half a globe away, celebrating and living for a little Jewish baby who we believe grew up to be the Savior of the world. Why? Because a group of people understood that this story was one that had to be told. Which led to the final part of our mission statement. What's in our DNA? Who are we? Well, the Northfield Church exists to love God, to love people, and to make Jesus known. And I don't know if there's any other higher calling that we could adopt for our own lives. Who are we, church? We are the called out group of people empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue the work of Jesus on this earth. What do we do? 
We love God with everything we have, heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we love people, our neighbors, like we love ourselves. And we live to make the story of Jesus known in the entire earth. It's who we are. It's what we're about. It's deep in our DNA. Father, I thank you for uh, just uh, reminding us a little bit about what, what we are to you, who you called us to be. And Father, I pray that we will be a people as we even leave her today and go out into the earth. We will be that, in, that called out group of people empowered by your spirit to tell the story of Jesus, to continue his work. And I pray, Father, that we will always be a group of people who love you, who love each other, and live to make your story known. May it be who we are and what we do. And the whole church at Northville said... Amen.